Hey B4 family, welcome to Sunday Snow Day. We just really want you to be home and safe today and so we've canceled our services, but we do have a couple of things to talk about and we have pulled out a service that we love from my dog is just wanting to be a part of all that's going on here and my trusty cameraman is helping me out. Um, so we have pulled out a service that we loved from last year. If you wanna have a more formal church experience this morning, it's on trust and it was one of my favorites from 2023. So enjoy that after this little talk if you'd like. Um, and I just, our staff has been talking about how this is the year of delight and we wanna just be intentional about delighting ourselves in God and who he is. And so when we have this unexpected pause, this little bit of Sabbath to be able to hunker down and stay in and breathe in sort of the fresh air of peace, Let's really take advantage of that and just look at all the beauty around and take some time, maybe with your family or your friends, to just talk about the things that you can see in your life that are really beautiful right now. And I think that's a good way to honor God on this Sabbath day. Um, I have a couple of little announcements, some little family talk before we launch into the service. The first one is pastoral transition update. We are making progress, but we have not made a final decision at this time. And I know there's always gonna be speculation out there, but please just believe that the updates that you get on the website and in email are the final word on what's going on in that. And I hope to have a, a more substantive update really soon. And if I can't provide a substantive update really soon, you'll hear that from me. So that's the first one. The second one is our dear Alex Lessler is gonna take a little sabbatical. He's been owed a sabbatical in, in Foursquare Polity. Pastors take sabbatical every seven years. And at our church, that's 12 weeks. And Alex has put off his sabbatical twice since he's been here before in order to serve B4 well. And so he will celebrate his 10 year anniversary here at B4 next month, but he'll be on sabbatical while he's doing that. So he won't be at church. We don't let people on sabbatical come to church because they'll slip into pastor mode. You won't see him, but I just want you to understand where he's at. He's been such a gift to us in 2023. He stepped up and did so much of the preaching load and carries so much weight in the just the organizational structure and leadership in our church. And we're so, so grateful for him. He will be back in 12 weeks. And then the last little thing is if you'd like to worship God through your giving this morning, we want to provide a link. I think it'll be at the end of this video or in the email that comes with it, but it's a link. You can also find it online and we'd love for you to do that if that's something you want to do today inside of your worship experience. Um, we are so thankful for your generosity. This year turned out really well and we're looking forward to an, a year filled with God's blessing as we become generous and as we just continue to worship Him through giving. So that's all I've got for you today and I'm so glad that you joined us online and I hope that you are safe and warm and that you take this moment to delight in who God is. Enjoy the service. Amen. 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 Sing hope falling. Hope falling down like rain, love. That I can't explain peace that fills my soul Light in the darkest place Light even in the pain It feels like coming on Let's sing together Where the Spirit of the Lord is there
where the Spirit is. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. Amen. Oh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I am free. Amen. Oh, free at last. nice for me to know there's room in God's house for me and for you. It's so easy to come into church and kind of feel like there's a spotlight on you or on your mistakes or the the way that you've messed up. But what's nice about, I don't know, I don't know if it's nice or if it's weird, but when we stand up here with these spotlights on us, I feel like It almost magnifies our flaws and our weaknesses. So we're all in this together. And if you, maybe you made a big mistake last night or last week or last month or last year, there's a place for you here because this is your father's house. This is where you belong. And there's this, there's this cool story. It's a prodigal son. Maybe you've heard it, maybe you haven't. You probably heard, if you've been in church a long time, you've heard this story preached a lot. And if you haven't heard it, then this is for you this morning. Either way, this is for you, I guess. But there's a story of a prodigal son. He messes up big time. And Jesus is telling it to these religious leaders and and people listening. The son messes up big time and he finds himself in a tricky situation where he's weighed down by his guilt. He's eating, literally eating out of a pig trough because he's wasted his father's inheritance. He's squandered it and rejected it and just messed up big time. And he goes, man, I remember my father's house and how good it was. I remember what we ate, how it smelled, how it felt, how it tasted, and it was good. And I'm going back. And here's the cool picture about the story. It says, while he was a long way off, the father saw him waiting. And I just think about you and the father runs to him. And I think about you and me and the father's literally running to his son because he's waiting for his son to come home. And for some of us this morning, God has just been here waiting for you to come home. It doesn't matter all this. All the, can, you, can we just take a moment in worship this morning and leave our sin and our shame and our guilt and the weight of life and our worry and our mental health and our depression? Can we just take a deep breath and release that and run to the arms of the Father this morning together? And you may take a second this morning 
and say, I've been doing my own thing. And I've been saying, like I say sometimes, Casey is Lord. But this morning that might turn from whoever you are is Lord to Jesus is Lord. And all you have to do is believe in your heart and say, I'm putting the Lordship of Christ over my life once again. I believe, it's simple. And as messy as you are, as broken as you feel, he's gonna meet you right there. So Lord, this morning we thank you that we're only human. And sometimes we make a big mess of things. But in our Father's house, we feel the warm embrace of heaven the warm embrace of a loving God who's not pointing fingers at us to condemn us, but you literally, your name is Savior. We're gonna sing about it in a second. You save us, you change us, you transform us. Thank you for that truth in your presence this morning. We pray in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. amen. We're gonna keep singing this morning.
Well, hey there, everyone. My name's Abby. Thanks for spending part of your weekend with us. We've got a lot going on around our church, so we wanted to take a few minutes and tell you about some things coming up for you and your family. So check this out. The Faith Journey Initiative exists to encourage, equip, and inspire parents as they guide their children on their own beautiful and unique journey of faith. The B4Kids team have prepared simple yet meaningful resources for babies through fifth grade that will work for any family in a variety of ways. Join us for our upcoming Faith Journey gatherings to pick up your family's Connection 10 resources and hear the heart behind it from your child's pastor. It'll be a great time of connection and encouragement. Register at b4church.org slash faithjourney. Hope to see you there. Facing loss and navigating grief is something that no one should have to experience alone. Our Grief Share support group exists to walk alongside of you. You'll find encouragement and connection as you rebuild and heal. You can join by registering at b4church.org slash grief share. Motherwise offers a place for moms to connect in friendship, honest conversation, prayer, and Bible study. We meet twice a month to grow in community and make the journey as a mom easier and a lot more fun. Experienced mentors lead our Motherwise groups, helping moms navigate life as mothers and friends. Register for our upcoming Motherwise at b4church.org slash motherwise. Hi, I'm Debbie Mills, and I'm the pastor of Marriage Ministry here at B4. We believe that God has a beautiful design for marriage at every stage. Our marriage ministries work to come alongside you to strengthen and equip you as you grow together. Whether you're planning on getting married, need some help along the way, or want to invest in your relationship, we'd love the opportunity to get acquainted and have you join one of our ministries. Our reunion course for married couples begins in late January, so now is the time to get connected. If you're getting married in 2024, the Engage course starts at the beginning of March. Connect with me as soon as possible at the email below. Thanks so much for being here with us today. We believe you're here for a reason. God has something He wants to say specifically to you where you're at. And our hope is that you leave encouraged and closer to Him than ever before. Let us know if we can help you in any way while you're here with us and be sure to connect with us at b4church.org and on social media to stay up to date with everything happening here at B4. We hope you have a great weekend. Uh, theme is the way of trust, but I'm going to start by talking about freedom because that's been kind of my word over the last two years. I've been pretty desperate in my life for freedom, and I am older than a lot of you, and most of my life, I watched my life going on around me, and I thought, eventually, I'll get to the place where everything's pretty perfect. Eventually, I'll get there. Everything will be straight, and I'll have all my bad habits broken, and all my fear stuff dealt with, and all my panic stuff. <coughs> Excuse me. I thought, I'll get, it. I'll get it all together as I go. But then the older I get, the more I look around at people who are getting old with me and realize, no, lots of us are still stuck. And I don't want to stay stuck my whole life. I think Jesus has promised freedom, and I want to experience true freedom. I really, really do. And, and I see that sometimes you can live with chains so long that you don't even realize they exist anymore. They become like an accessory to your outfit. Like, how do I walk around with all these chains? Well, I'll just make it look good, I guess. And the history of the children of Israel shows us that exact thing. We see starting in Exodus, we see the children of Israel landing in 400 years of slavery. And then they have this little brief moment where they're, they're free and they're on top of the world. They even become kind of a superpower for a while. And then they fall to the Assyrians and then the Babylonians and then the Persians and then the Roman Empire. And they know almost no days of freedom as a, as a people group. And so then when we turn the timeline, the corner on the timeline from A.D. to B.C., Jesus steps into our world and says, I'm going to tell them about freedom myself. 
And so in John 8, he stands next to some people that says they're good Jews that he's talking to. And he says, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Now a slave has no permanent place in the family, but a son belongs to it forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That word in the Greek means free emphatically. Free, 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 free. And so the Jews respond to him by saying, we're good Jews. We've never been in bondage to anybody. And this is a real mystery to me. This question is, it begs, where, what country are you living in? You have been, have you not seen Prince of Egypt? Do you not understand that you guys are slaves? They're slaves even now to the Roman Empire. And so Jesus has come not just to offer them freedom, but to offer them insight into their own condition. You're, you're not free. You could be living more than this. You could be living bigger than this. And I think that's what I'm longing for in my life to say, God, where, how am I living now and how could I be living? So I think this idea of being free seems really complicated. How would it work? How would I ever manage it? Theology can seem complicated. I've been studying it all of my adult life and I'm telling you what, it's pretty complex. I read a book a few years ago. I'm not gonna tell you the name of it because I don't <laughs> recommend it, but it's a big long name. And it's a, uh, and I don't think any of you would want to rush out and buy it because it doesn't sound very exciting. Um, it's, but when I read it, it talks about how really in order to read the Bible at all, to be able to understand any of it at all, you have to know Greek and Hebrew. You have to be able to parse a Greek verb or else you can't really know what the Bible actually says. And at one point in my office, I just shut the book and kind of smacked it and was like, no, we need a theology everyone can understand. We need a theology even people who aren't able to read can understand. Certainly, we need to be able to know and love Jesus in spirit and in truth without being able to parse a Greek verb. It's got to happen. And so sometimes we overcomplicate how this needs to look. How do we get truly free? For my money, I have boiled this down to two words. The, in fact, the, these are the two words I think I, I, I could say I'll die for these words. There are about 17 different statements I would probably part with 20 bucks over. <laughs> but th this is the, the truth I would actually die for because I believe it so strongly. Trust him. Trust him. Trust him. That's, that's really it. It turns out who you, how free you are is all about who you trust. All of life our freedom depends on what we put our trust in. Um, there are about a hundred scriptures of trust that I'm going to read to you now. <laughs> I'm not. It might feel like it, but I'm not. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's Psalm 3. But bless, that's actually Proverbs 3. I have that wrong. Um, but blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord, whose confidence is in him. They will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots in the stream, by the stream. It does not fear when, it, when heat comes. Its leaves are always green. It has no worries in a year of drought and never fails to bear fruit. Psalm 56, in God, whose word I praise, in God I trust and am not afraid. What can mere mortals do to me? Isaiah 26, you will keep in perfect peace those whose minds are steadfast because... They trust in you. So freedom is all about who we trust. When we put our trust in the wrong thing, we become slaves to that thing very quickly. We put our trust in a boss or a spouse or in something going right, an expectation. If you've ever been one of those people who sits in front of the returns on election night and you feel your stomach drop and you feel your heart start to get all agitated and you're like, oh no, oh no, oh no, what's happening? That's trust in a leader. That's trust in a governmental system. God promises perfect peace to those who trust in him, regardless of perfect circumstances. So true freedom is trusting Jesus and his work of redemption in our lives. Sometimes I think we, we have this concept that the enemy or Satan is, is after our trust, like he wants us to trust in him. And actually, I don't think the enemy cares if I trust in him. I don't think he wants, me, he wants me to be in charge of my life. I don't think he even wants that responsibility. I think he wants me to be in charge of my life. 
I think he wants me to trust me because that'll do the job. That'll get me, that'll get me messed up. And so I have learned that I am just not a great master. I just don't do a good job of it. Paul said the same thing in Romans 7. He said, I do not understand what I do for what I do for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is in my sinful nature. So this is not going to be a popular statement. It's not evolved. It's not politically correct. But it's something I've come to believe is absolutely true. I cannot be exclusively trusted with the running of my own life. I embedded it. I would be way better running your life. I would make a great boss or a God for you because I don't deal with all the churning emotions of the things that you love. So I can just look at your stuff and be like, oh no, you should, you should not handle it that way. It'll be easy. You do it my way. We're not great at running our own lives. I need to trust Jesus instead. And, and it, it, trusting him is not the same as loving him. The loving him is essential. Loving him is the, the greatest commandment. Trusting him is not the same. Think for a minute about all the people you truly, truly love in life. Your kids and your grandkids and your people and your siblings. And, and now think of all of the people on that list that you would trust to save you from a burning building. Not the same. Trust and love are not the same. I asked a group of single young women once, what's the most important thing you're looking for in someone to share your life with? You know what their number one answer was? A sense of humor, uh, 100% was their answer. So funny, guys, you're in. There's a sense of humor. And then I asked a group of divorced women, what was the number one thing they were looking at? Someone I could trust. They had some, they had some experience that guided their new core values, their new list. Love and trust are not the same. We live this out <clears throat> in the real world all the time. We uh, trust lawyers we don't love to distribute our money to the people we do love. Trust and love are different. Trust sticks through the hard stuff. Lots of people loved Jesus. Many followed him. He was fun to listen to, but they left when it got hard to trust. Listen to John 6. From this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. Jesus has just done a little sermon with them where he has this great idea. I'm going to give them an analogy if you need to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And the crowd is like, we're, we're out. We're not going to do that. And so then Jesus says to his disciples, you do not want to leave too, do you? And Simon Peter answers him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. This word believe in the Greek doesn't just mean to know. It doesn't just mean we have our intellectual questions answered. We figured out what happened with the dinosaurs. We figured out the creation story and how that all works. We figured all these questions out in the Bible. It doesn't mean that. It means to entrust. It means to lean your whole life into the hands of someone you maybe don't understand entirely. You maybe don't quite get totally. You maybe still have some questions there, but to believe is to trust into who God is. We're going to look at the evidence of who God is after Easter. We're going to dive into the gospel of Luke. I'm so excited and look at eyewitness evidence of who God is because we need evidence. Um, Hebrews, a, a scripture we like to cross stitch on pillows and hang on our bathrooms and plaques and stuff. Um, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. It's a really interesting kind of mysterious verse. It's full of some cool kind of mystery. It, and this word substance means substructure. This is the substructure of our belief. So when you look around this room, it's beautiful and there are lots of things to admire in it, but no one ever comes in here and says, man, the framing underneath these walls must be awesome. But the framing in these walls is what holds the roof over our heads. It's arguably the most important thing. And this is it. Faith is the substructure, the thing that holds our faith in place when everything comes against it and shakes and says you should pick any other option. And then it says faith is the evidence of things we can't see. I love this word evidence. We all need 
evidence. We all have evidence, actually. You just have to sometimes go through the history of your life and see where you find the evidence. But we all have evidence, a reason why we believe God is who he says he is. I've told you before that I hate to fly. I really, really hate it. But I fly a lot because I love to go places is the thing. I can't drive to Italy. And so I fly. And every time I get on a plane, literally every time, I stop and think about what a stupid idea it is. Like this is not, this doesn't make sense. I'm about to entrust my life to a pilot that I do not know. I don't know how his life is going. I don't know if he has a will to live or not. I'm about to trust my whole life to him. And I probably wouldn't trust him with my bank account password. So I don't get on the plane because I trust him. And I don't get on the plane because I trust the mechanics. Because I'm telling you, I don't know anything about the engineering or the aerodynamics or what makes a plane take off and land safely. In fact, every time, every time the wheels come up and we're getting off the tarmac, I think this same thing. This is against God's plan. This should not be. Humans were not meant to fly. God would have given us wings. We should not be flying. This is a big mistake every time I feel it. And so I don't get on a plane. That's not the evidence. The pilot isn't. He looks like a nice guy. Probably he'll fly. It's not that. The engineering isn't. What the evidence is that makes me get on a plane is that while I'm walking to my plane, there are people getting off safely. I see all kinds of people stepping off a plane and they're doing fine. And so that is the evidence I have. I have evidence that when I look out the window, I don't see airliners crashing to the ground. And since I don't see that, I feel like it's probably safe to get on. Do I have 100% confidence in the plane? No, I do not. How much confidence do we need? Well, for me, I need about 51%. That's what I need. And sometimes, (laughs) and also when I'm in the plane, it's not pretty. I mean, sometimes I can do it. Sometimes I'm okay. Like I haven't had coffee. I'm not overly anxious and I'm okay and I can handle the bumps. But sometimes when the bumps happen, I'm just like praying that God will tell my kids I loved them. I don't enjoy it. I'm clinging to the passenger next to me. Even though I have enough faith to get me on the plane, that doesn't mean I do it perfectly. But the plane still doesn't crash because the plane isn't dependent on my trust. It flies independently whether I trust it or not, right? What is the trust for? It's for my peace. It's for my shalom. It says in Psalm that he is faithful as the sunrise. Does the sunrise come because I believe it will? No. Why do I count on the faithfulness of the sunrise? Because it helps me stand when the night is really dark. So trust, even when it doesn't look beautiful, even when you don't think you're doing it very well, even when you're just bringing your 10% to the game and saying, this is all I have, but I'm going to stand on it. This is all I really can believe in right now. That one time where I think God showed up in my dreams or that one time when God was next to me, when somebody was dying that I loved, or that one time that God showed up in the form of a check or a friend or a hug or a phone call, I am going to plant my flag in the evidence I have that God is who he says he is. It'll get you on the plane because once you're on the plane and it starts to bobble, that's not fun. But where else am I going to (laughs) go? Only the plane is going to get me to my final destination, right? Where else are we going to go? You want to trust in government? Try it. You want to trust in a bank account? Good luck. I'm telling you, this is what we have. We have a living good God. So what do we need to trust in about him? We could, we could pick a thousand things. There are a thousand things about his character in the word of God, but I'm going to just tell you two trust statements that I think will hold the weight of your belief system in him. One is trust that he is God, and one is trust that he is good. Just that. Trust that he is God, and trust that he is good. Trust that he's God. He runs it all. We exist because he says so. We matter for the very same reason. This quote I loved by Walter Brueggemann, he's one of my favorite theologians. The Old Testament has no interest in articulating an autonomous or universal notion of humanness. The human person has vitality as living, empowered agent and creature only in relation to the God who faithfully gives 
breath. Do you believe that today, that you're not here unless he decides you take your next breath? I mean, isn't, in some way, isn't that a huge relief? Like, I don't know, I'm not in charge of this thing. I had a moment in my life when my second grandson was, uh, do, was still in utero. He hadn't been born yet. And my husband was dying. And my husband had been given two months to live in November of 2014. And my daughter announced that she was pregnant and she was due in July. And when she said that she was pregnant, my husband said, well, that's my new goal. And his goal was to meet his grandson before he died. That was his goal. And I just thought there is no way, there is no way he's going to last that long. And then as time went on and he did last and Phineas's um, birth expectant date became closer and closer, I found myself getting more and more uptight and more and more just asking God, please, 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 please let Steve live to see him be born. Please let Steve live to meet his grandson. And I was dealing with so many other things at the time that at one point I just had to give up. And just, I remember just laying on my bed and just saying, God, I can't be in charge of first breaths or last breaths. At least that. I can't at least do that. I have to trust you with that. And the, the outcome of the story isn't the point. But I will say that Finn was born and my daughter and son-in-law raced him and put him in my husband's arms. And he wept and prayed over that little boy. And he died 12 days later. And it was like two pretty helpless men of God just sort of high-fiving on their way through. And I'm always grateful that God is in charge of the beginning and the end. He is in charge of the full expanse of our days. If I truly, honestly believe that God is and he owns everything, if I truly do believe my life is only vital and empowered in connection to him, then how miserable will my life be if I don't trust him? It's miserable to believe that someone is in control of your whole existence and you don't think they're good. You think they have bad ideas or bad motives. If I'm always grabbing the wheel, it's going to be really hard. And then we have to trust that God is good no matter what, even when it's really hard. Here's why. Because one of the ways we grow best is through trouble, I am sorry to tell you. We grow between a rock and a hard place. David said this in Psalm 18, he reached down from on high and took hold of me. He drew me out of deep waters. Where is David? In deep water. He rescued me from my powerful enemy, from my foes who were too strong for me. That's awesome. Where was David? Surrounded by foes who are too strong for him. He's in all of these hard places because God is like, I'm on trauma bond with you now. I'm going to show up when you need me to. Trouble builds trust. It does. I don't think you're probably the kind of people who watch reality dating shows. I may or may not be that kind of person too. I don't even you know, have to imagine. But here's the thing. I would imagine that at the end, when somebody wins, and she's the one that the guy has chosen, or he's the one that the girl has chosen, what happens, I'll just tell you, what happens is they've been on a lot of wonderful dates. They've gone to dinner at the Eiffel Tower. They've gone to uh, swimming with the dolphins. They've gone in helicopter rides over the Rockies. They've done amazing things together. And then they are in love. And then at the finale, they are not together. And you're like, what happened to your love? And they always say the same thing. Once I saw him dating 24 women, I couldn't trust him anymore. Oh, no. Is there a flaw in that system? Yeah. Let me tell you about the flaw. The flaw is this. If you want to have them love and trust one another, they need to go to the fantasy suite with three toddlers under three who have the stomach flu. That's what needs to happen. If you want them to trust each other, two words, Ikea furniture. Put a, put a shukum together <laughs> and see what happens. See how you do. Invite both your families over for Thanksgiving and talk politics. This is how you build trust. You build trust through trouble. That's the depth of your relationships. That's how we trust God is in trouble. And he does not promise he will move us around it. He does not promise it. He only promises that he will be on the plane with us.
That's all he promises, and it's enough. So when <laughs> my son was 15, my husband was in his last two months of life, and I realized with horror, oh, no, I'm going to have to teach that kid to drive. <laughs> and I am telling you what, I am not a cool person to drive with. Even experienced, uh, okay, it's my husband, he knows, I don't, I don't drive well, I'm the feet on the dashboard, oh no, things are going wrong, um, I don't trust well in the driver's seat, and especially not with inexperienced drivers, and I had recently gotten a, a relatively new car, it was new to me, and I loved it a lot, but I was like, I can do this, I can absolutely do this, I can be both mom and dad, I can handle this thing, and I get in the car with Josiah, bless Josiah, and by the time we get about a block and a half, he just turns around and comes back. He's like, I can't. I can't do it with you. I can't do it. I don't even know if we got going up fast enough to trigger the automatic door locks. But I was just like, this is terrible. And so, and my husband's friends rallied and, and taught Joe to drive. And I'm so thankful for that. But the thing is, do I love my car more than I love my son? I, I do not. I... Um, Josiah and I became a team because his dad was sick and died early in his life. And he is a kid that I can't even tell you how deeply I love him. He is one of my favorite friends and he is one of 10 children I would lay my life down for. I would take a bullet for these people. I do not love my car more than I trust my son. Do I love my car more than I trust him? Yeah, I don't love him more than I love my son. But do I love my car more than I trust my son's driving abilities? Yes. <laughs> Certainly. I do. And I think that's the question for all of us. What do I love more than I trust Jesus? What am I holding in my hands or my heart that makes it really hard to get on the plane? Here's the thing, you could take your doubts on the plane. You can. you can. You can take a lot of things with you. You can scream and cry and grab for the wheel, but get on the plane because it's going somewhere. I just, I don't want to be one of those people who get, get stuck on the ground and never experiences life beyond where they are when there's this grand adventure to live in the love of God. There's something beautiful to pursue. Can we trust him? Can we trust him with our children and our government and our money and our time and our relationships? Can we trust him? We can love him and keep trust out here. We can love him and still do things our own way. But love and trust, when they go hand in hand, it creates shalom in your life. When you can trust God fully with everything, you can live in peace in a way you haven't lived before. I am always amazed when I get to the end of a flight and it lands. And you know the first thing I think? Why was I so worried? Why couldn't I just read a book? Why not just enjoy life? And I just wonder if we would ask God to, to increase our trust, to get us moving in that direction, how, what would we find our lives could be like? Could we be free of the fear that assails us at night? Could we be free of the stuff that makes us turn to our own way and our own decisions and our own stuff? If we're willing to truly trust him, how could that change our life? It doesn't have to look perfect just want to bring our trust, get on the plane and say, I don't have anywhere else to go. Only you hold my destiny. Only you hold the words of life. Only you hold the plans for me that are for my good. Jesus, we love you. We love you and we thank you for your good plan. Would you just take a moment and do a little inventory of your own soul? Is there anything you're holding this morning that you say, I think maybe I love this more than I trust Jesus? Maybe I love this thing and it's hard for me to trust him with this thing I truly love. And if you could look at your life, like you look at the 
the battery on your cell phone. Kind of see what your trust level is this morning. Maybe you've come in really low. It's really hard to trust that God is with you and for you. It's really hard to trust that he is good. Would you ask him even now to show you some evidence? Remember where he's shown up and where he's been true to you and when the the times where you know you wouldn't be here if it weren't for something supernatural that had interrupted, that had intercepted. Jesus, together, like your disciples, we say increase our faith, increase our trust in you. We want to be people who live out shalom in this world, and we know that trust is going to be essential. So I ask that you would step into the moments that we don't know what to do, into the moments where we're afraid to let go. Would you step into the places where it feels so, so hard to let you do what only you can do? And we ask that you would give us evidence again that you are good and you are God and we are safe in your love. We love and worship you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, if you'd like to receive a benediction, would you stand with me today? May you be men and women who hear the voice of the one who loves you. And even if you haven't figured him out, and even if you have some questions, May you find that your heart is willing to step on the plane and let him take you exactly where he wants you to go because you know in your heart that he can be trusted. In the name of the one who makes everything new, amen.